So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jamie Hare, and I am the SUNY Online Program Manager at the SUNY Center for Professional Development. And we've organized this um, series of workshops in June and in August, kind of strategically preparing us to dive into the course delivery series this week, just as we're in the midst of preparing for our students joining us either virtually, uh, asynchronously, or face-to-face. Um, -face. So. With that, I'm going to dive right into our goal setting and updates presentation this morning. And I wanna introduce you to our raft. These are the people who have made this uh, series, this institute possible. And that includes Teresa, uh, myself, Tonka, Victoria, Chris, and Sonia. And I thank all of them for their help, their advice, their, uh, <laughs> kind of calming voices when I panicked a little bit. They've all been incredibly helpful. We have an updated schedule. For those of you who uh, registered early, we've added three additional sessions. And the one this afternoon is at 315. And that one is by a, a vendor called Engagely. And it's a great tool. And I really encourage you to take a peek at it. Um, they, they've got a brand new pricing model free uh, for this year for SUNY participants. And it's it might be something you wanna check out. The next one is on Tuesday at 3.15 and that's an OER presentation, which will be really interesting. So I, I hope that you, you join us for that as well. And then on Wednesday, we have another one at 3.15 and that will be given by Packback, but it's not necessarily about the product. It's actually about how to engage uh, students in discussion forums. So with that, we will move on to our goal setting. So of course, we're going to begin with Mentimeter again, because I loved it so much last uh, June and it, it's gonna be a part of my presentations primarily going forward. So if you want, you can aim your phone right there at that QR code and it will take you directly to the Mentimeter thing. And it might be easiest if you work on your phone, if you have a smartphone and that way you can see what's going on on the screen on your computer and then uh, participate on your phone. But if you have two screens or you just wanna work on your computer, you can go to www.menti.com and use the code 473 38717. And that will take you to the Mentimeter site where we can kind of do some polling. So I'm going to put the first question up here, but I'm going to give you a little bit more time to answer because I'm imagining that some people are, are still getting logged in or getting ready to participate. But the question here is uh, a multiple choice. It's actually multiple select. So you can choose any number of uh, these options here. And thank you, Megumi, for, Megumi, for putting in the Mentimeter code um, 4733817. And the question is, what are you hoping to get out of this, uh, this August series of the Otter Institute for course delivery? So it seems like um, a good portion of you are looking for student engagement strategies, uh, motivational design, innovative or alternatives to lecturing with uh, supporting students effectively coming up there in third place and collaborate, collaborating and networking opportunities, of course, and promoting equity and inclusivity. Effective feedback seems to be trailing there, but that's all right. Maybe everybody's confident in how they're providing feedback, although we do have a session that's going to maybe offer some alternatives to feedback later this week. So I hope you all take advantage of that. Oh, yes, Chris, thank you for that. Chris pointed out in the chat that this is for effective student feedback, yeah. All right, so we've had 19 participants. So I'm thinking that's about what we had. We had about 50% of our people participating in the Mentimeter last time. So I'm gonna move on to the next question here. Oh, we just had another voter and more. <laughs> I jumped the gun. All right, I am gonna move on though. So we'll ask the next question here. 
The next question is, how are you planning to prepare for the fall semester? And we have options of working independently, working with your campus resources, whether that's instructional designers or your teaching and learning center or whatever that might be called on your campus, working with SUNY online resources, such as uh, the SUNY online uh, instructional design team, if you have a SUNY online course or working independently. And good morning to those who are just joining us. Oh, the other option I forgot to mention was in collaboration with my department and colleague. And that one seems to be almost as popular as working independently. All right. I like to see all the collaboration that we've got mentioned here. That's great. I'm going to wait for 21 and then I'll move on. <laughs> for those of you just joining us, if you would like to participate in the polling today, you can go to www.menti.com and use the code 4733817. And I'll type that again in the chat. That is 4733817. And you go to www.menti.com. Right, so it does look like the vast majority of people are working independently or at least working in collaboration with their department or a colleague. Uh, the other, uh, the, in third place there comes with working with campus resources. And that's, that's great too. Your instructional designers there on campus are definitely there to help you uh, with your teaching practice. Oh, let's go on to, if you attended the June Otter series, did your answer to the previous question change? So did you learn something about the resources and continue to work on your own? Did you learn about resources and then started to work with your campus resources or start working with SUNY online resources? Uh, you changed and started collaborating with the department or a colleague or you attended, but it did not change your answer. And I did not attend the June Otter session. Interesting, I'm so pleased to see so many new faces here electronically, virtually. Okay. That's great. For those of you that didn't attend the June Otter series, we did a series in June that was about course design. And uh, that all of those sessions are recorded on the same registration site that you use to uh, register for the August series. So please feel free to check out any of those uh, uh, presentations. We had great presentations, if I do say so myself. So I encourage you to do that. Okay, so it seems like outside of the I did not attend uh, the June one, the most popular answer seems to be that you learned about the resources, but you continued. Um, you continue to work on your own. And Tim, I'm glad your provost suggested the workshops um, and I'm glad you're, you're here. We'll be doing this again next summer. So keep that in the back of your mind as, as we're uh, preparing for next year. All right, so I'm gonna ask, we asked in June, uh, how much time people uh, planned to spend uh, preparing for the fall semester. So I'm gonna ask it again in this way. How much time have you spent over the course of the summer uh, developing a single new course or refreshing an existing course? And then we're gonna kind of compare that to what we showed in the June uh, series, just to see how those numbers compare. So when I hover over this, you can kind of see how many people are, are indicating the amount of time on each of these responses. Okay. So it seems like a lot more people spent, A, more people were spending more time refreshing an existing course than developing a new course, which is interesting. Um, 
okay, great. And some people spent upwards of 80 hours, which is what we would anticipate people spend developing a new course. So some people were spending a lot of time putting some serious work into these courses, lucky students. All right, so let's see how that compares to the, the June responses to that question. And you can see here that um, uh, most report planning to spend about 20 to 40 hours developing and or refreshing a course from, from the June dates. And we were just about there with the refreshing an existing course, but seemed to, to be a little bit less on the developing of a new course here. I see Trevor was indicating that's multiple courses. I should have specified like on average uh, overall. So maybe that's what people were doing. Okay. All right. So this is a slightly different question. So hang on before you answer. This is not just making changes to your course content, but how much time have you spent preparing to teach or demonstrate your instructor presence? Those things that let the students know this isn't just a computer generated course, this is a human being who's going to be there to help them through the course, help them acquire the, the learning that they need to acquire, you know, provide them with support um, and other, any other way that you can imagine uh, kind of establishing that you're present in the course rather than they're just talking into some void. So how much time have you spent preparing to do that? So it, it seems like what I'm getting from these numbers is you spend almost as much time preparing to be present as you do in preparing your course materials. And that's, that's great. That makes my instructional design heart happy because it's more when you're teaching an online course or remote course or even a face-to-face -face course, it's more than just the course materials, right? When students get asked at the end of the semester what their experience was like, more often than not, it relates to the teacher more than the material, right? And they remember the teachers long after uh, they've graduated, the ones that have made that impact. So this, this makes me really happy. All right, great. So this is an open-ended forum that, so you can ask questions, you can post them right here and they'll pop up here. So what questions do you hope to get answered during the, during the August Otters Institute? And so this week, we're gonna be talking about course delivery strategies and that's gonna go from lecturing techniques to providing student feedback to accessibility concerns to uh, creating a supportive and welcoming environment for your students. So what kind of questions do you hope to get answered during this week? peer collaboration options, okay. Just hoping to add to my knowledge about giving quality feedback. Good, how to offer synchronous and async at the same time. I'm wondering if somebody is doing high flex there, uh, helping students to not procrastinate the work. Oh, we have a session specifically about that. We're gonna address that specifically. Uh, and also the one about the quality feedback. Uh, how do folks keep students engaged throughout the semester? It's all on my list, good and how to make, motivate students in online courses, how to do high flex efficiently. I just want to gather as many ideas as possible to teach a wide range of students and engaged learners. All right, I think that you're all going to have some, some questions answered this week then. Uh, how to deal with disengaged or passive online learners, techniques for what are, we are calling concurrent classes, students online and in-person at the same time. Okay, so like a, a hybrid of the high flex. And what are some alternative methods for creating interactive online learning other than just discussion boards? Okay. How to deal with information overload, overload, <laughs> not overload, in course delivery techniques. I am experiencing it and I'm sure students feel the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's easy to get overwhelmed with all of the tools, all of the, the kind of things that you have to do in order to be in that engaged instructor and they have to do to be an engaged student. Yeah. How to make online learning enjoyable for both student and instructor. 
I hope that uh, at the end of this week, we'll get questions to all of those. We might not focus specifically on high flex this week. Uh, I think we will discuss it in one session, but that sounds like maybe we should do some additional programming on high flex before the semester starts, because I know quite a few campuses are picking that up or at least doing some version of it. All right, note to self. All right, so let's move on to the next question then. And I asked this in the June semester or June sessions, but I'm wondering if it changed at all. What modality will the majority of your courses be in during the fall 2021 semester? Face-to-face -face, uh, with no online uh, supplement, face-to-face -face with supplement, asynchronous online, remote online, uh, high flex, hybrid, other, I forget what the options were because they now have disappeared for me, but. That brown is a terrible color. Why would they choose it? <laughs> so, all right. So it looks like face-to-face -face with an online supplement is coming up on strong, followed by fully online. We have a number of the hybrid or blended or um, which seems to be, they're being characterized differently than high flex because my guess is that the students don't have choice, right? With that hybrid blended, <laughs> right, Tim, that's the next question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, Tim had pointed out in the chat that this question should really be two parts, uh, what we are planning versus what's actually going to happen, which I believe, Oh, I just wanted to compare what the responses were in the June. So we had 13, nine, and five, and this time we had nine, six, and two. So in the, the spring, we had more people planning for face-to-face. -face. So I wonder if we just have fewer of those people here or if uh, we've had to shift the way that the courses are going to be delivered already. Interesting. So <laughs> I thought I had a question about whether or not, oh, I do, it's later, all right. So right now this intrusive otter is here and, and she wants to check in on your progress since June or since the end of the spring semester, how you're, how you're gearing up for the fall semester. And some of these questions are based off of the presentations that were done in June. And so the first question is, do you or will you have a welcome video in your online or remote course? Uh, whether it's asynchronous or synchronous, one that kind of sets you up as, as the presence there in the course, gives them a sense of your personality, lets them know, you know who you are, that you're there and, and warm and welcoming them to the class. Wow, a good portion of you do have that video. All right. It's one of the things that students report that that quick two or three minute video, video even, it doesn't have to be a long one, just saying, hey, I'm your instructor and, and welcome to class. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with you. It gives them a voice and a face to the name and it, it kind of makes them feel like it's not an automated canned course for them. So if you haven't already, um, I do encourage you to do so. We have some, uh, videos or presentations from June that talk about how to do that. We'll have some uh, information this week too about how to do it in a really kind of uh, engaged fashion. And good for you. I'm glad to see that uh, we had a comment here that they do it for in-person classes too. I think that's really important. Um, all right, so that was heart heartening as well. Do you have in, uh, do you have a welcome email that you send to your students prior to the start of the semester? Uh, for those of you just joining, Patricia, I see you there. Um, you can go to www.menti.com and you can use the code uh, 4733-38717 to join this. And a student ran into me in the hall last week and recognized me from my welcome message. I didn't know who they were as I didn't have their photos for the online course. Isn't that great? Uh, it, like that didn't used to be for online courses. You were completely anonymous and, and students didn't know who you were, but these videos, these using your images in the course, 
let them know that you're a person. It's amazing. That was a good experience for you, I hope. So it looks like the majority of you do have that welcome email that you send to your students prior to the start of the semester. And I think it's a great way to uh, encourage students to, particularly if it's an asynchronous course or it's a remote course to log in, uh, to get into the online course materials and check it out. So uh, again, sets the stage for uh, them knowing that you're gonna be an involved instructor, et cetera. Uh, it's uh, for Patricia, it's www.menti.com. All that information there is at the top of the screen if you need to refer back to it. And it'll be on every slide that we're doing these live questions for. All right, so let's move on to the next question here. And did you or will you preset weekly course announcements to your class to keep them up to date? So, you know, we, we encourage faculty to do weekly announcements, but how many of you do like the Monday morning at 6 a.m. course announcements, like this week you're going to, this week you will expect to, et cetera. And then you, you can add as many other announcements as you want, but you at least preset all of them ahead of time. So that if you're you know, sick on Sunday or you sleep in on Monday, the students are still getting that kind of uh, same thing. Um, I see the question here is menti.com free to use. It is, but it's limited in scope. Like you couldn't do this type of presentation in the free version. You, I think you can ask two questions for free and then you would have to delete that presentation and, and start a new one. Um, I use it more often, so I was willing to pay the little bit to pay for it, but um, you can certainly uh, use, if you only plan to ask one or two questions uh, in a course or in a class period, uh, you can do that there. Thanks, Aaron, for, for posting that there. I have uh, found that this uh, Mentimeter is amazing. In fact, my daughter uses my account too. Uh, she did some presentations this summer and loved it. So kind of gets the, uh, the, it, that up-to-date modern feel to it. All right, so it looks like the majority of you do use your weekly course announcements um, or at least set them up ahead of time. It doesn't mean that you don't do it, but that you, you kind of get it out ahead of time. Yeah, Jay, I think that's smart too. They set the announcements in the learning management system so they aren't on email overload. Agreed. Have you or will you update your syllabus to be more inclusive in language and design? And this was one of the presentations that we, uh, it's actually kind of like a combination of two about inclusive design, but also about uh, rethinking your syllabus that Chris Price, who's on our um, planning committee here, my counterpart here at the CPD, uh, did. And I think it, it got a lot of people thinking about their syllabus. That's great. The, the vast majority of you have actually updated your syllabus to be more inclusive in language and design. I know I switched around my, my calendar because it was not accessible because of the table. And so I shifted that around. Okay, that's good to know. Chris, your presentation was effective. <laughs> so has your online or remote course gone through the Oscar rubric process or will it before the start of the semester? And Chris, uh, uh, not Chris Price, who I was just talking about, but Chris Mart, uh, I don't wanna butcher your name, I'm sorry. Um, the Italian language, lessons I took in college make me want to say Marchese, but I'm not sure if that's right. So, so much of this was informed by the June session and there were so many helpful resources that were shared. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of you have done the Oscar process. That's great. Oh, I'm curious about those others. So if you have a comment and you selected other, please feel free to put that in the chat so we know. Marchese. Ah, uh, okay, gotcha. Actually, that is in Italian. Marchese. CH is supposed to be. Yeah. Okay, sorry. In progress, haven't finished all courses. That's great, Trevor. All right. Good number of you have, have gone through the Oscar rubric. 
have you created new or updated old video for your courses? You know, whether or not you had to uh, change them for accessibility reasons, or if you had to adjust them to make them more lively or shorten them or uh, kind of break them up so that it wasn't a one hour lecture, it was like uh, 10 mini lectures of six minutes each, et cetera. All right, lots of updated video. I think that's that's a time intensive project, isn't it? Okay, and I do not use video, no, okay. I'm wondering if the no responses are because their their videos were already kind of meeting the, the standards we were talking about in June. Fingers crossed, that's what I'm hoping anyway. All right, great. Learning Screencast-O-Matic this summer to learn to do this more easily. And I love Screencast-O-Matic. It's, it's such a great uh, free tool to use when you're creating these short videos. And, you know, it's, it's free and it's easy. It's great. Have you made progress in making your course materials more accessible? So that includes your, your syllabus, includes your videos, it includes you know, making sure that the, the links that you're linking out to, if they're videos, they're captions, et cetera. If you have Ally, you know, have you seen your overall course score, accessibility score increase? Do you see more greens than yellows and oranges in your course? Also, Renee posted, I had invested many hours developing short videos that are focused on certain topics that students can ask, access. That's great. And they do appreciate those short videos, right? Great. PDFs are a pain. Chris mentioned that in the chat. Yes, they can be very challenging. If you, um, and a lot of campuses, if you're having trouble with a PDF, if you go to your library, a librarians or your accessibility office, they can help you with that. Just in case you, you didn't know that. All right, so that was the end of the, our progress checks, kind of seeing how you guys are, you know, what you did over the summer, whether or not you maybe sat on the deck too many nights instead of, you know, plugging away at the computer and, or maybe on the beach or whatever. And now we're gonna dive into our post-pedagogy pivot. We did this in June and we've uh, modified the questions slightly um, from the, the fall or from the spring as we dive into the fall here. So this was a question we asked in June. And the question was, what is one thing you learned about teaching online during the pivot that you'll incorporate into your standard teaching practices? And we used this word cloud. And what we did was then we took the, the statements that seem to get the most um, like duplication here that make it fun, communication, study groups. And now we're going to ask people to share uh, some of those things that we've we've incorporated. So what strategies um, have you used to increase flexibility in your courses? And this is an open-ended one, so you can type it in and it'll pop up here on the screen for us. Um, if you haven't that, used them, that's okay. That's what we're here for. We're, we're here to share um, these. So maybe it's something that you can incorporate in your own course. Having one due date per week rather than daily. Using one note as my whiteboard. Mm, interesting, okay. How has, how has the OneNote as your whiteboard increased flexibility? What does that look like? Ah, okay. So they can focus more on what you're saying rather than uh, studiously taking notes. Great. That, that falls into what we're gonna be discussing on Friday about um, teaching techniques that uh, um, leverage the brain's uh, capacity. And that's one of them, you know, like having them attentively listening rather than multitasking is definitely one. Using an iPad for teaching, leaving discussion boards open for at least two weeks, using Remind to text students uh, reminders of due dates. I use Remind all the time, it's the best. 
Keep objectives and activities short and not long-winded. Students have an easier time focusing and fitting things into their schedule. Yeah. Personalized learning. Yeah, different projects allow student choice. That is the ultimate flexibility, right? Letting them choose something that resonates with them. Every course in our 100% online program had the same dates for assignments. So students always know when things are due, including exams. You know, it, it, despite the fact that that sounds inflexible, it actually gives them flexibility, right? So they can choose which day of the week they're gonna work on it because they know it's always gonna be due at one point, right? So counterintuitive flexibility and yet flexible. Open world design students can access materials like syllabus and PDFs in multiple places. Ah, kind of like that liquid syllabus that Chris was talking about in June. Interesting. I move due dates when needed, check in with students weekly to track completion progress. Great, great, that's very flexible. Uploading every session on YouTube afterward. Again, great, it allows students to focus while you're actually in the session and then they can refer back when they need to. Having a discussion in week one of a module that feeds into week two assignment. Ah, that's great. That's that closing the loop, right? So that they're, they see that the value in participating in the discussion as it leads into uh, the week two assignment. Great. I've developed varied learning outputs for students so that they can make choices based on their access to technology and to one another. The choice is so important there. Students can make up late work or redo assignments using course tokens, which they get at the beginning and can earn throughout the semester. Interesting. So like uh, you can say you get up to three free passes and then you can choose when to use them or they can earn more. That's interesting. Communication tools like Discord so students and peers can answer questions and don't need office hours anymore or as many hours. I've heard a lot of people using Discord. A lot of the, the younger students are using that, you know, for gaming, but they've, they've incorporated it into teaching. Great. So Patricia put in the chat, optional WebEx sessions, Q&A to discuss new unit openings, okay. So they can join you. Uh, so Trevor was posting, I can share it with my students after that and I can also prep it ahead of time. Oh, that's right, Trevor, you'll, you'll talk about that in your presentation. I'm very excited about yours. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Share what strategies you've used to improve or modify the feedback that you're giving to your students. I'll, I'll stress that, Chris, that it's for your students. Oh, so, so Megami posted in the chat that my students use Discord for study sessions, but they didn't want me there. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, show a student where they can review the rubrics, right? Uh, and, and walking them through what the rubrics mean is really key, right? And A, the use of rubrics is huge. They, they know what to shoot for. Using our LMS to accept and return work. Oh, so I'm gathering that you're a face-to-face -face instructor. It also saves trees when you do that too, so it's great. We're gonna be, have a session later this week, Chris Price is gonna do that on some methods to kind of alternatives ways to provide feedback. So I hope everybody joins us for that one used audacity to make audio recordings that give overviews of why answer key answers are correct. Great. Audio comments in Blackboard? Yes. Great. That's the presentation I was just referencing. I use audio and video to provide feedback. Tools like VoiceThread allow them to respond as well. You know, the benefit of those audio feedbacks, whether it's through video or just audio, is sometimes the, the text in your uh, feedback can be um, misinterpreted or they don't know uh, your emotional state behind the, the uh, language you're writing. So that those audio feedback can let them know that you're being uh, constructive and, and supportive. It's great. I use detailed rubrics in the feedback, but also provide feedback directly on their submissions. Great. I'm sorry, now it's moving for me. So be positive, all answers right and wrong, get guiding feedback for a review of, or big picture, right? So that that harkens back to that fail is the first attempt 
um, in learning, right? It's not failing. It's, it's just your first attempt. We're learning it. Great. And Chris said uh, that the audio video helps with instructor presence. Absolutely. All right, we're, they're coming in so fast, I can't read them all. <laughs> but you guys can read them on the screen here. Yeah, the multiple ways to get feedback, I think is great. And I saw one in there before it disappeared. Uh, yeah, use adaptive release to find common errors and offer support, right? It's it's taking a peek at are our, our, the bulk of my students missing a particular uh, topic or a question on an exam that might mean I need to come back and, and review how I'm instructing, how I'm teaching that. Uh, do I need to change that around? Do I need to spend more time or, or kind of reframe it for them? Great, you guys, thanks. Oh, hang on, I think I moved ahead too fast, sorry. So now share what strategies you've used to improve or modify communications or check-ins. Um, have you, decided to use Remind or Discord, or have you encouraged students to meet with you, you know, two or three times a semester each individually, or um, what have you done to change um, your communication strategy with your students? For myself, I found that using Remind made it so much easier to address questions immediately. Uh, someone's taking an exam and they use Remind and I, I know right away versus it goes to email or it goes to Blackboard. And I yeah, Remind worked really well. I have to log in, et cetera. And, and that help is almost instantaneous then. And the nice thing about Remind is you can turn it off. Like I don't get notifications after nine or before seven. So pre-scheduling annou announcements has been helpful. A lot of remind. It's free, by the way. It's one of those free tools. Um, we had a presentation on it, not this June, but last uh, June of 2020 on remind that was really well done. So you can check that out on our CPD YouTube channel there. Weekly hour and student space on campus to make it easy for them to come and see me for questions or just a chat. Okay. I forget what that's like <laughs> being on campus. Individualized supplemental feedback, recurrent invites to one-on-one -on -one sessions reflecting their interests. Oh, interesting. Ah, so you, you make sure that you're reaching out to students who aren't meeting the uh, stated expectations, right? So kind of like that little poke, hey, this is important. And then they might get that nice little prod that they need. Ah, good, encouraging students to unmute and let me know if I missed a comment in the chat. Yeah, those limits here uh, about that you're not gonna be available at all hours of the day, every day of the year, we're humans, right? We need those breaks. And so, but as long as the students know what those are ahead of time, they can kind of plan that into their, their uh, studying or uh, exam completions, or at least know when to expect to receive that feedback from you. Good. All right, so let's move. Oh, there's somebody else answered, I'm sorry. We'll see all those comments. I post that in the presentation. Um, at the end of the week. What is one thing you learned about assessment during the pivot that you'll incorporate into your standard teaching practices? And that was a question we asked in June. And we can see uh, flexibility, critical thinking, and focus on application. We already asked a question about flexibility. So I'm gonna jump to critical thinking and focus on application. So uh, what strategies have you used to increase critical thinking into your assessment? And you know, assessment doesn't necessarily just have to be exams, right? It's anything that's assessing their learning. So it could be discussions, it could be group work, it could be um, a paper, it could be whatever you imagine or use for assessment in your own courses.
reflection questions asking students to relate materials to their own life, right? We'll talk about this when uh, in the Science of Learning series. We have parts one through three for that. And we talk about how that kind of elaborative rehearsal, that relating it to multiple things in the, the student's brain actually leads to deeper learning, uh, more profound learning. Uh, the connections are made in multiple places that way when they're asked to relate it to something in their own life. Uh, formal self-review. Okay. Uh, having an open-ended bonus question on exams to list everything you learned that was not on the exam. What an interesting idea. Trying to link my questions to something they like uh, or are aware of in their life. Great. Use of case studies and evidence-based projects. Application to real societal issues, creative thought and solutions. Again, all, all, so many of these are great practice, peer and self-review. Having students use initial posts that reflect on why misconceptions occur about our concepts and where people, where problems occur in cases and they do response posts that need to provide examples or solutions to the misconception or, sorry, problem. Okay, asking for reasonable, sorry, now they're scrolling too fast for me to read. Asking for reasonable ranges to answers. I like this, it's, it's flexible and critical thinking all at once, so many of you have. And I really, I think I might steal this idea, uh, having open-ended bonus questions on exam. And because that lets you know, maybe if a lot of students are saying they studied for one thing and it wasn't on your exam, like maybe you should put it on your exam because they thought it was important, it's great. All right, so let's move on to, I did talk about flexibility. I lied before when I said I didn't ask this question. So how, um, what strategies you've used to increase flexibility in your assessments? This is probably going to be a lot of a rehash from the, the previous questions, I apologize. Um, so what strategies uh, have you used to increase flexibility in your assessments? I'm sure it'll go with like, you know, you, you have some flexibility in your dates, you've changed the dates in your course to a single day so that they can choose which days they work on it. Anything other than what we've already mentioned about flexibility in your assessments? Using multiple methods of assessment, yeah. Multiple attempts on quizzes. Yeah, it depends on what your, your uh, kind of intention is for that quiz. Is it to see that they master the material or that they knew it at that single point in time? Great. Yep, dropping the lowest grades, uh, whether it's quizzes or discussions, it's important. It allows people to have a bad week, right? Options for paper prompts. So, you know, what it can do is for students who, you know, do well on all the, the quizzes, the first seven out of 10, they can just skip the last three if they want. Yeah, uh, giving the students flexibility to work ahead when they're able. Absolutely. That differentiated learning that allows students who are a little bit faster, uh, a little bit more motivated maybe to, to get ahead and the students who want to go with the course schedule to go with the course schedule. That's good. Uh, those the asynchronous courses, you know, those are nice to have that single due date with everything due at midnight, and students can be working at Sunday at ten. Teaching online and remote in flip style, leaving class time for discussion. That's great. That that can be challenging for students to adjust to, but it's it definitely impacts learning outcomes. All right, so let's move on to sharing what strategies you've used to increase the focus on application in your assessments. Like, how are you going to apply this knowledge? I'm curious to see what people do in order to 
to move to that level of blooms to apply. Retracting when needed. I'm not sure I understand what that means. If you want to expand on that in the chat, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Ah, reteaching when needed. I gotcha. Discussion board prompts ask for application and their answers, citing resources, sources to support their opinions. Great. And that's the important part, right? Asking for the, the resources so that they just don't go in and give some anecdotal answer. It has to be supported, increases the academic rigor. We give everybody an opportunity to answer here, but I think this is a, a challenging thing sometimes for, for faculty as we're teaching our classes. The assessments are tools that the learners will use elsewhere. Uh, their work will have real world applications, okay? <coughs> I try to scaffold the learning. My, my choice of weekly assignments are focused on helping students with the concepts of their final project. So by the time they submit their final work, they can apply the feedback they've received along the way. Great. Regularly ask them to reflect on what they are learning in the course. That reflection is important. Great. Increase real, real world tie-ins to lessons. Uh, students have options in what they submit for review. I, I think that that's, uh, harder in some topics and much easier in other topics, right? But it's just as important to let students know that what they're learning has a purpose and whether it's the purpose is to prepare them for a higher level course, right? Where we're creating that base of knowledge so that they can then start to think more critically about the information or not, but at least letting them know the why of their learning is important. Patricia, I see your comment there in the chat. Each unit is scaffolded to be incorporated into the next unit's work, right? And we'll see that in the science of learning this week about how important that scaffolding is, that creating that, that foundation, like when you're building that house, you know, and you build it on top of the next thing, repeating back some of that information that, that uh, increases that learning, great. So, this is a question I don't know how many of you will answer, although maybe the Discord uh, person might. So share what strategy you've used to incorporate study groups into your instruction. I tend to use my daughter who's in college right now uh, as her as an example a lot, but she uh, works with the faculty members on campus and they create uh, study groups in GroupMe. Uh, which is another free tool, but it, they, they do the study groups and then they work with the TAs or the professor and then they put like guided questions in there and then all those students work together to prepare for the exams. Um, uh, that's one way that I've seen people um, incorporate study groups into your instruction. Has anybody else uh, done that, uh, incorporated study groups? Ah, I know, but will, okay. I'm curious uh, for the people who have or want to what uh, resource they might use. Are you gonna use the learning management system? Are you gonna use Discord? Are you gonna use GroupMe? Uh, you could probably use Remind or somehow finagle Google Docs to do it. Uh, this summer students arranged a group on their own, which I related to in an alternate WebEx sessions arranged at the beginning of each new unit for Q&A, nice. It's nice that it was student driven. Besides creating collaborative assignments, I offer option, optional group areas where students can help each other and study together and the learning management system, okay. 
having office hours on Zoom and opening breakout rooms for each class so that the students can work together as I hop from room to room. Great. That, that means it can be self-guided and teacher-guided. It's amazing. Those are some great ideas. Thanks for sharing. We don't necessarily discuss st study groups, but I have group projects where students have to work on a progressive case study and have to collaborate together to come up with their group's weekly decisions. Okay. That group work can be challenging, but it sounds like you've got a handle on it. All right, I'm aware that we're running out of time here. So I'm gonna move on uh, to one thing you learned about student engagement, you can see here breaks, flexibility, feedback, communication, and check-ins seem to be the most popular here, flexibility being key. Um, so share what strategies you've used to make your courses more fun. Not necessarily fun, but more fun, because I was assuming that they already were, right? One of the strategies I, I do at the beginning of the semester, I have them vote on an animal and that's where I theme the entire semester. All of my memes, all of my pictures and the announcements are based off of that particular animal. The last one was cats, so that made me really happy, but um, that's just, so then I use Canva to, to use those all. Kahoot competitions, amazing, do those too. They love that. Provide them with study games, good. <laughs> Chris Price, fun. School isn't supposed to be fun. You're right. It's not it's supposed to be horrible. Uh, telling stories that relate to the current material as an introduction to the material. Great. You know, those anecdotes, the, the making it uh, applicable to real life, it, it kind of confirm or kind of, I don't know, makes that learning more salient. They remember the story. They might remember the facts that are associated with the story. Really smart. Starting class with a silly story about my toddler from the day before. Great. They are, they are story generators, those toddlers. Sharing their favorite food plate, and we will go around the world. So if they like a particular uh, food place, maybe. Uh, if they like a particular place, they know we will get there. Interesting. Might try that. Asking them to offer alternative prompts for discussion board assignments. Uh, I lost it. Include some anecdotes, et cetera. Okay, getting to know activities, Kahoot, not just at the start of classes, yeah. Using journaling, more personalization, of course, content and room for students to be heard and validated as individuals, right? That makes the learning really personal. Games that can be related to the topic of the day. It sounds like a lot of people are put in an effort to make their courses enjoyable, right? Not just uh, places to learn. Chris, uh, mini debates at the start of each class, often silly things like pancakes or waffle and engages them pretty quickly. Ah, great. Uh, weekly optional three minute activities that students can participate in if they wish that are focused on mindfulness and help them with stress relief. Ooh, that's smart. A friend, had the best discussion of the year over flavors of Pop-Tarts. Mm, Trevor, that sounds interesting. Agree, Chris, is a taco a sandwich. Also a new Zoom feature allows the breakout rooms to call or request the host of their room. Oh, interesting. I haven't played with that yet. Using memes to learn in a humorous way. I am all about the memes. Thank you. Whoever did that, you're my best friend. Um, Using uh, GIFs or GIFs, depending on which side, that could be one of your questions that you ask, is it GIF or GIF, uh, to determine how they feel about this week's course materials. All right, raise your hand in Zoom if it's GIF. <laughs> All right, uh, clap your hands in Zoom, you know, use the little feedback buttons if it's GIF. Okay, we're, I'm seeing a mix. <laughs> See, that's how you can start your class with people arguing <laughs> about pronunciation. Great. Funny. All right. I'm a GIF gal there because it's a graphic. The word, the G stands for graphic. So I go with G. All right. Although apparently the guy who invented the term GIF says it's GIF. So 
It's kind of like the toilet paper over under argument. Who knows? All right. Thanks for that. I really appreciate the, the fun things that people had there. I love that we had so many people participating in that particular one. Ah, Robert Becker, gif like a giraffe, but it could also be gif like a gift. What is one thing you learned about inclusive teaching or accessibility during the pivot that you will incorporate into your standard teaching practices? And we see here understanding and use of clear language uh, popped out at us. So what are some strategies you've used to be more inclusive through the use of clear language? We're having a lovely debate here in the chat. Uh, Tim indicated that his screen is blurry. Is it clear for everybody else? Okay, good, it seems to be clear. So it must've been on my end, sorry about that. Okay. I see we're de still debating GIF or GIF. Share what strategies you've used to be more inclusive through the use of clear language. So describe what is in diagrams. Don't assume students see what you think they see, right? We might find that students don't know how to read diagrams or graphs. Point out what's important for them to see there. That's great. Allowing time to clarify my meaning of words on exams for anyone for which English is not their first language. Good. That is really important, right? Something that might seem clear to us, some sort of idiom or colloquialism that we think is commonly used might throw somebody off. <laughs> Are you guys in the chat? <laughs> uh, translate psych theories into experiential or behavioral language, great. A hyperlink, any reference that may require cultural and understanding such as nuking in a microwave. Ah. Um, in multiple languages. That's great, right? That goes to those colloquialisms or um, um, neologisms or idioms, right? That we use normally, but someone with um, uh, English as their second language might not understand. Call out implicit bias when I notice it in the textbook. Ah, excellent. I do that too when I'm referring uh, to uh, psychological research, right? There's so much uh, ethnocentric research that we talk about there. And I definitely call that out too. So use less slang, relatable, but it changes too fast, right? That's wicked. <laughs> I'm going to love this week. You guys are a great crowd. All right. I think this is our last question. So share what strategies you've used to be more inclusive through understanding. <laughs> So I know we're at the end of our session. I apologize if you want to take that 15 minute break, please feel free. I'm just gonna wait for some people to <laughs> answer these questions. <laughs> I gotta turn off the chat because I can't focus here. So uh, anyway, uh, we'll keep going till we're done with this question here and, uh, but we'll start at 10, 11, 15 there. Giving second chance is great. Having time for international students to share about their home country and or religion. Interesting. I add flexibility it, through understanding. I talk about how I understand that life can sometimes get complicated and you might have a week where you just fall off the face of the planet, right? And so that's where I build in those those dates that, uh, or the, the options to drop a quiz or a discussion forum, great, because I have those weeks, they have to have those weeks too. So they, 
I understand life happens. So if that happens, you know, you have this many things you can drop from your grade, just come back the next week or let me know, right? That's, that's understanding, like we're all humans. All right, so we're just gonna skip that one today. For those of you who are interested, we are recording this, of course. Um, make sure that you visit the suny.edu slash otter website and the uh, recordings are typically up within 24 hours. Sometimes the presentation materials take a little bit longer to get up there, but they are up there generally within a week. And thanks for joining us this morning. I do hope that you come back at 11.15. Hang on just a second. I want to read the title of the presentation coming up. Uh, oh, this is the one on HyFlex. Uh, Flexible learning experiences improve access for SUNY students. And that is a panel of instructors who are using these kind of flexible uh, teaching experiences, the the high flex, the low flex, the blend flex, you know, whatever people are calling them on their campuses. So I hope you join us then. All right, have a good break, everybody. I'll put the uh, Otter Cam back up. <laughs>